the Max. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh-huh. did you know about that beforehand? I had heard about it, I think because other guys had maybe thrown one, you know, so I'd seen it come up on Twitter or whatever it happens to be. I'd never really thought about, like, a goal of trying to throw one. It's all about sequencing pitches and how you set it up. I was walking to the ballpark, actually, and a couple of the fans said they, they had some dinner reservations that night that they had to get to, so... You're trying to go complete game and throw the fewest pitches possible, but it gets so convoluted and so complicated, especially the Cardinals. First meeting of the year between the Cubs and Cardinals, the tall, likable right-hander, Kyle Hendricks. It's his 15th career start against the Cards. When you watch a game, you know there's things that go on behind the scenes. For me, fortunately, in the position I'm in, it's the most fun part of it. When the game planning happens, you know, you're taking obviously the pitcher's strength, what Kyle does well. And then you're taking the approach, like what's our game plan specifically for those hitters. It takes me and Tommy and Brad Mills about six or seven hours to put together a full report for each series. Kyle takes our information and he preps as well as any pitcher you're ever going to meet. It's a breakdown of every hitter individually throughout the lineup. I sit down at the computer, I start with the first hitter, and I break down, okay, what pitches and what options you're going to have to a certain hitter, whether it's early in the count, late in the count, or middle counts. And then I'll go to the video and I'll see what the swings actually look like visually. Then I pretty much memorize exactly what options I have to each guy. If you go early curveball on him, expect the swing. He doesn't really take it. And then we sit down and we have our attack plan. Yeah, if I get to two strikes, that there go, is a swing. It's there. There is so much that goes into those game plans, but it always goes to the pitcher to be able to execute. We just tried to say, all right, let's start with the first pitch of the game and let's go out and attack and see what happens. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Well, Carpenter, he hit eight homers against Cubs pitching last year. Carpenter, when I first came up, he killed me. He was one of the toughest at-bats for me, and so whenever I face the Cardinals now, he's now hitting leadoff for him. When you're facing a team that you have a lot of history against, they know how you're basically going to try to attack them, and we know that as well. And he doesn't swing at a lot of first pitches, really, ever. We are underway, a swing and a miss for strike one. It just was like, whoa. Carpenter, he pretty much takes almost every first pitch, and especially leading off. Matt Carpenter, for the majority of his career, has been one of the lowest first pitch swinging guys in all of baseball. So for them to kind of tip their hand, I guess, a little bit was something we noticed. Swing and a miss, change up. Carpenter out in front, down he goes. After Carpenter swing at the first pitch of the game, here is Paul Goldschmidt. Goldie taken, that kind of brought my alertness back down a little bit. He bounces one slowly to the left side, and that's out number two. And then DeYoung. Two down, nobody on. It brings up Paul DeYoung. He is patient for the most part, and especially against me. I would get ahead of him just with a lot of easy fastballs. Then he gets really aggressive, so you can expand off the plate. But we really wanted to establish the inner part of the zone with him. I had two outs, nobody on. I can afford to fall behind 1-0. Hendricks is sharp, one, two, three, after a half. I think we were even trying to throw a ball in there. It brings up all the flags, and that's why we come in the dugout, and it was the first thing we talked about. I've been there behind the play long enough against San Luis that I know when they're aggressive and they're patient. But that day they came out of the gate like swinging and swinging and swinging, and they were just looking to hit the fast one. They're doing their homework too, all right? So they're game planning for Kyle. Kyle had had a few games that were rough, you know, before going into this, and the success that those teams had was jumping on stuff early in the game. 
A lot of teams don't want to get to his changeup. They want to avoid his best pitch, and in doing that, they're going to swing early. They come in, and Willie's like, hey, they are swinging. I'm like, um, I get you. We're, we're going to use it. You want them to swing. And Schwarber makes the catch. If they're swinging and being aggressive, you don't want to take that away from them. Martinez takes a wild swing and a miss. Let's use their aggressiveness against them. Here's the next offering. Sobers has room, makes the catch. Three up, three down. Hendricks, two perfect innings in the book. When you see these types of games, usually the, the strike zone is big. The umpire's giving you some help. This isn't the case in this game. And that's what makes this so astounding. He pitches to contact, to weak contact. He tunnels the ball so well that you think you're swinging at a pitch in a certain zone, and then next thing you know, it's changed lanes on you, and all of a sudden you're getting blown up. Pitch tunneling is basically the effect that a hitter sees on two comparative pitches. The longer those two pitches can stay in the same trajectory in that same path toward the plate, the harder it is for me to differentiate what those two pitches are. He's, he's a master at that, for sure. Kyle's able to make all versions of his fastball and all versions of his changeup look alike coming out of his hand. So they're coming off the same line. And then, as you see the ball get closer to home plate, they all start doing different things. The four-seamer just plays straight. His actually has a little bit of cut and the two seamers go in the opposite direction or going downward. And then, on top of that, you have the three versions of his changeup, I mean, that no one else has. He throws a cut changeup, he throws a faded changeup, and he'll throw a straight changeup that goes down. Those all come out of the same tunnel as well. We're talking about five pitches that all look exactly the same coming out of his hand. That's what makes him so good. Clarity at first, two outs, and it's Matt Carpenter. I got ahead 0-1 on a bunt attempt. This looks like a great opportunity for me to not waste the pitch because it's being used for something but I'm not necessarily looking to get a strike. It's really just the visual for the hitter. If you look at the side view, it's a straight fastball and an arcing curveball, but from the straight, when they come out of the hand at the same trajectory and this one keeps going and this one dives, that's tunneling. I rely on my two-seam and changeup, but if that's all I'm throwing, then their effectiveness is just gonna go way down. So you have to pick your spots where you can throw your other pitches so they're not as locked in on your two best pitches when you need to go to them. Now he has the curveball in his head. It just might make him a tick later on the fastball. And then just a little bit more out front on a changeup. He'll head over to the bag and get the feed from Rizzo. He has to wait until the last second to try and recognize, oh wait, is this a heater? Or, oh, it's a change of, that's the difference between hitting the ball right on the sweet spot and missing by that much and having it be weak contact. All his stuff that day is locked in and when those things happen, this is what he can do. Schwarber in to make the catch. I've always been a guy that works quick. I like to keep the fielders behind me on their toes. I like the action to be moving, and for the hitters, I like them to feel like I'm aggressive. Ideally, you would love an inning to average 12 pitches. Not that you're counting all the pitches out there, but you have a pretty good idea around what number you might be. Hendricks, through five, has given up one hit and no runs. Since they had been so aggressive, we just started getting a lot of really quick outs and quick innings. I told myself that this is an easy game. Every time that I call any pitch at any count, anywhere, he will execute it. Line to the scalpel. 
Well, I'm not saying he's perfect, but he's close to perfect. And it is time for the seventh inning stretch. Nothing was going to knock him off of where he was going. This guy was locked in. Definitely one of the most enjoyable games I've ever been a part of. It felt like you're just sitting in a rocking chair, sitting at the pond, you know, catching fish. Ball strike three. And they stand for the professor. I knew we were getting outs quickly and that the game plan was working. All of a sudden, I'm in the ninth inning with 71 pitches. You're like, oh my gosh. At Wrigley, there haven't been many times where I've been able to get into the ninth inning. Kyle Hendricks on the mound, starting the ninth inning, working on a three-hit shutout. You start running out there, they play your walkout music again. It's like this whole nother thing. Like, no, just don't listen. Just forget about all this. It's just another inning, okay? Because you know how close you are to the end. Plus, I got Goldschmidt coming up. When I got the pitching coach job, Rizzo came in and says, like, congratulations, figure out a way to get Goldschmidt out, please. Now Goldschmidt is 471 career on base average against the Cubs is the highest all time. His 699 slugging percentage, second best against the Cubs in the live ball era. Not only is he so talented physically and what he can do and how strong he is, but mentally, I know he puts in so much video work. He knows what I'm going to be throwing him. So now it's just throw something that he's not looking for. You can't ever really quantify just how sequencing matters. It's about putting the pieces together, almost seeming like you're a step ahead every pitch. At that time, he was taking a lot of first pitch curveballs. That was something we had in the report for sure. Yeah, we know we can go to this if we need it. I don't think I had used it much in the game before this at bat, so it provided me an opportunity where, okay, I know I can get strike one. First pitch curveball dips in there for a strike. Guys have an approach. Goldie's looking for something in that count. And if he doesn't get it, what makes him so good is he's got the ability to not swing at those pitches. Now, where can we find that strike two? When you break down hitters, they show you how you can start them. You see the glaring holes with two strikes that they have. But where do I go to get strike two? That's something I've always searched for. Sometimes getting strike two in an at-bat is the hardest strike to get. And so really trying to pitch to a foul ball has become like a really good way of getting that strike two and bridging the gap. I'm throwing a change up middle into a right hander a lot of times with Kyle strictly for a foul ball. The 0-1 to Goldschmidt. Line foul past third. The count is 0-2. There's a change up. He purposely throws middle in for that purpose exactly to get a foul ball. When you have a guy who has a strength like Goldie can hit a sinker middle in, that's fine, just give it to him. Just give it to him in a place where he's not gonna do any damage. He swung at it thinking that's gonna be a fastball and it's a changeup and he hooks it, you know, 100 feet foul. That's the epitome of, <laughs> of pitching right there, right? Take a strike, swing at a ball. Now I have a 0-2 and really I have any option here. With a guy like Cal, you might start thinking, okay, after a changeup like that, you're gonna come with a sinker in. And Cal was smart enough to call the pitch outside of the corner. All he's seen is slow stuff. That's probably why he ends up being late on a 87 mile an hour fastball, yeah. <laughs> and the 0-2 pitch, swing and a miss, strike three. Fastball got him. You're like, wow, how did Kyle just blow an 87 mile an hour fastball away by Goldschmidt? Well, it's because of how those first two pitches played. Swing and a miss. On his 77th pitch, he gets his 26th out. You would think you're facing a guy throwing 95 miles an hour, and then you look, and it's Kyle throwing 87. The clip makes you think, God, this guy must be blowing. But that's the beauty of Kyle Hendricks. Just about everybody standing at Wrigley. Here's a swing and a pop-up. It's gonna be a shutout for Kyle Hendricks. He's got it. Kyle Hendricks goes all the way and shuts out the Cardinals. An 81 pitch complete game shutout for Kyle Hendricks. They call him the professor, but it was a 
an artist at work here this afternoon. Everybody's seen those games, those Maddox games. And for it to be Kyle, you know, it's perfect. He's the epitome of what Maddox wanted to do. Kyle Hendricks is a pitcher, and I still find it refreshing that there are guys like this in baseball. It was just one of those days where everything fell into place and everything worked, and you don't get a lot of those, so you really you need to relish those moments.